Champions of Psychology is meant as education and entertainment. It is not a substitute for medical advice or professional counseling. Discussion of mental health topics will be primarily rooted in research and the personal experiences and self-disclosures of the hosts. While we can provide generalized education and possible mental health resources, we cannot offer any recommendations, advice, or opinions for any specific persons, cases, or situations. We provide these resources and links at our sole discretion, but have not necessarily vetted or reviewed any resource. We assume no liability for the use of the information or resources on these sites, and we encourage you to use your own best judgment. Hello, and welcome to Champion Psychology, a show with the goal of openly talking about mental health and gaming, presented by Codename Entertainment and TakeThis.org. Every Tuesday at 12 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, uh, Pacific Standard Time here on Twitch.tv slash CD Games, or later on your favorite podcast service, Mitra Jordan and Rafael Bucamazzo, aka Dr. B, talk about mental health and how gaming affects us. If you're this live in the chat, you can leave a question that I, Trevor Bettis, will ask them later in the show. Our topic today is going to be hoarding healing potions, which I didn't change in the overlay. Apparently, I didn't change anything for some reason. Reason. So I will fix that as the two of you let everyone know who you are uh, in case they don't know. Excuse Shit, me. I need a bell so we can just yell shame. Shame. Oh, yes. Yes. That would do, that's I'm, so in keeping with good therapy. I'm I, I the worst. clearly need one for my practice. Shame. Punishment, shame, and no. humiliation. Those are the cornerstones right. of how to raise a good generation. Don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. Wow. Please do not do that. I knew All I right. Getting something. I think Champions of Psychology today is about how not to do things. <laughs> <laughs> how not to do how not. Yes. Anyway, I am Mitra Jordan. I have a private practice in Victoria, British Columbia. I frequently remind myself of what not to do. I try to focus on what to do. But today uh, we're discussing scarcity and hoarding of things for later when we really need them. Yes, I do that's need the them. short version. Yes. Are you going to use them, though? Hey, them you know, you I, I might write a whole book in all of these good? We're gonna. Okay, we're gonna <laughs> we're, get into this. We'll talk about the notebooks, Trevor. <laughs> oh yes, we we're gonna talk, talk about, about the notebooks. Full, full we're disclosure, about many chat. Things. Full disclosure, chat and, and listeners. Uh, when we were going over what this episode was gonna be about, I went, "Ah, this is another calling Trevor out the, for an hour episode." <laughs> this this is gonna call all of us out in a variety of enjoyable ways for, oh my for God. our audience and perhaps even for each other. Right. So, <laughs> Absolutely. Wrap in. Get ready. Let's go. Who is this guy? Who is this, this guy? guy? Yes. Who is this guy? You well, you. Who that's you a be? that's a fun existential question. That's a show unto itself. Who am I? Who are we? Who are we all when we are together? Oh God, Do I no, relate just to keep you? it Does simple. Does my identity change <laughs> when I'm with you versus when I'm May not? May I with introduce you? Dr. Rafael Bocamazzo? But if we get into the Martin Dr. Boomer, B. I thou. I'm going to be honest. Mister just posted better than I ever have on this entire show. She was like, "No, we are going to get on topic. Introduce yourself here. I will introduce you." <laughs> I mean, but he has to keep us on topic, and it's frequently each of us at various points. Well, given I'm, our I'm, proclivities. <laughs> Because we have those. I, I'm Rafael Bocamazzo, better known as Dr. B for long Italian name reasons. I'm a clinical psychologist in Washington State. I'm the clinical director at TakeThis.org, um, which, uh, you know, if you're not familiar with our work, we are approaching our 10th year of offering mental health education and destigmatization work for gamers in the game industry itself. Um, and apparently I'm going to off, I'm going to be a bad example of what not to do today. I'm essentially going to become Led Tasso. And it is going to be a glorious, glorious thing. Shout out to all you Ted Lasso fans. And who are you, Mitra Jordan? I think I, I already did, you, did that. Part. Did you already, already did, that part? did that part? This part is, this this episode's been all all around whatnot and everything. Hoarding <laughs> health potions. What do we mean by that? What well, we're talking about, we're talking about a scarcity mentality. We're talking about this idea that when resources, whether it is physical resources, whether it is emotional or interpersonal resources, that this idea that if you lose this, you will not gain things back. And we see it in a variety of contexts. Um, we, we, we see this, you know, um, one of my favorite, well, actually one of my favorite uh, authors for interpersonal relationships, Dr. Nerdlove talks about this when it comes to dating, being scared of 
I will never have it better than. This can be yeah. um, the idea that like I used to do in Final Fantasy IV, I will save up every possible <laughs> item for when I really need it. Never mind that I've been trying to fight the same boss for a day. I don't actually need those health potions right now. <laughs> I need them for the end. And then I finish the game with 16 stacks of health potions. Um, yeah, I mean, this idea that we, we will never have things again is what we're going to be talking about largely. Yeah, it's the fear of using things that we deem valuable or precious in some way, right? So the good China could be one <laughs> way. Um, I have this sweater I love, I better buy two because what if I'm never able to find one like it again, right? I, so, I appreciated yesterday you both calling out the entirety of my Italian family, uh, the older generation. <laughs> And the fact that as soon as you mentioned plastic coated furniture, I'm like, I'm just, oh. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, that came from one of my absolute dearest friends whose, whose parents had a, they had two kitchens. They had a good kitchen that they never used. And then they had the kitchen that was sort of garden level or kind of not quite basement. And that was where everybody hung out. And I didn't even know the good kitchen actually existed until the day of her wedding. Because you see, I'd always just gone in through the downstairs kitchen and the sort of, you know, there was a little living room, but it had a couch that was covered in plastic, you know, even though it wasn't the good living room, it still had the plastic covered couch, but there was a good kitchen and a good living room. And the only time I saw that was the day she got married because I'd made her wedding cake and, you know, I'm bringing things in mm -hmm. and they're saying, oh yes, yes. Bring it in here. Where? <laughs> seen this part of the house <laughs> no what is this oh yeah we don't use that one <laughs> don't That's use that incredibly wild. beautiful stove big kitchen yeah we store things in the fridge though of course so <laughs> yeah it's amazing well and and it's really interesting how you know so we this hits us on so many levels like in I, I'm thinking about we, we've talked about utility of things, but also there's there's whole industries based on this scarcity idea. There's these capitalistic things, um, I, <laughs> NFTs, uh, that <clears throat> the that you know the scarcity mentality. You will get status if you yep. get this thing, and it works. Oh yeah, it works on so many levels. I have a I, I love it. I'm not going to knock it. But I have a brand new Dungeons and Dragons jer a hockey jersey because as soon as I saw only 300 will be made, I was like, buy, 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 uh, buy. I think it's pretty hot, too. <laughs> it's, it's really cool. It's so cool. <laughs> but it works. Mm -hmm. it, it works because as soon as you say something is rare or you offer a really good price for it. Yeah. Um, and, you know. I see oh, wow. this a lot with hobbies too. It's like people collecting things. Oh yeah. Um, but they don't get around to using them because there's only so much time. So no, but you're ah. enjoying that one. Yep. But uh, I also still but... like that the green head just vanishes. Oh, that's amazing. It's true. <laughs> Looks oh, really great. Oh, it does. Mm. So yeah, but acquiring, would you acquire a second one of those? I did for Luke McKay. <laughs> <laughs> No, you did it as a gift. Yeah, though. yeah. That's yeah, I mean, you had a different. very specific yeah. purpose for that. That's true. And you and I, you, we talked about this yesterday. That I've done. I do the same thing for certain limited edition beers because I make beer. I love beer. I love all things food and drink related. And there's a certain beer release that happens every year that I buy two bottles of. Mm. One to have now. One to store for a couple of years. Yeah. So I can taste the difference. And I bust that out when you know a couple of years later and get. To to enjoy that yeah. but it's a really specific purpose that i do it for and i'm clear on the intent yeah and i think that that's the difference right part of what happens with anxiety and a sense of not enough is anxiety as we've talked about is very what if based it's about mm -hmm. yeah what i'm worried about in the future right so you know if i'm worried i don't have enough or i won't have enough right then i might acquire things for a uncertain future which never arrives Right. And um, and we do this with things that we really want and value now, not necessarily recognizing is this still going to actually be important to us in the future. Mm -hmm. Right. It might it might really not be. It might be irrelevant. 
um, at some future time. But it's this idea of what if I don't have it then that really takes over. So, uh, yeah, that, that is one of the effects. Because, yeah, we were listing off some good things there, but that is definitely some of the effects that can happen. What are some other things that can happen from this sort of mentality? Well, how about being stuck in relationships you don't want to be in? Mm. Yeah. I mean, that's, the first, that's, that's something that I encounter with people all the time in the work that I do, whether teenagers, adults, and so forth. And I think most of us can probably think of at least one relationship, whether it's a friendship, whether it's a romantic relationship, whether it's something like that, that um, we've even been stuck in because we've been in this mindset, well, what if I never achieve something yeah. like this again? Yeah. Not even what if, I, it's not, hey, I could have it better than this. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. kind of what if this is the best I can get and there's nothing else out there. Yeah. Yeah. And that's yeah. awful. It is because you really do feel trapped and, and unhappy in those situations. But at the same time, there's this fear that more happiness isn't possible, essentially. Mm -hmm. That this yeah. is as good, this is as happy as I'll be. And then there's an awful lot of um, justifying the relationship. Well, it's not so bad, or we had a really good day yesterday, or it can be really nice, you know. And relationships that are really hard to leave are the ones that aren't necessarily, uh, they can be with someone who's really great, but not for you. Mm -hmm. So you see that you see that they've got some lovely qualities, but it's just not, you know, it's just not gelling. It's not meshing yeah. um, or they're just intermittently good. And, right. you know, because if it's really always a tough thing, then we're probably going to leave because it's always uphill. And if it's always great, we're, we're probably not even going to think about leaving. Why would we? Mm -hmm. We're happy. Mm -hmm. But if it's this this place where it's sometimes good, sometimes not good. And we can, um, we can extrapolate this kind of thinking out to work environments as well. I'm not happy. I'm not unhappy though. It doesn't but really the job get better market, than this. It's so awful right now. I mean, where am I gonna find another job that offers me benefits? I mean, everything is a gig based oh. economy these days. Right. Um, I'm gonna have to start over at the bottom of the ladder and I'm just gonna be a contractor again. And I worked so hard. This is a crappy job, but Oh my God, I've, I, I have full-time benefits and a 401k and I'm just going to lose all that again in this economy. I even have all that stuff. And I still felt that way about the restaurant manager job. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really found it difficult initially. I mean, I worked in restaurants for 12 years and um, I found it difficult because I had accrued a certain amount of skill you know, as a master pastry chef, and I was doing this, and I was doing that, and was working at some of the best places in the city kind of thing, in the country even. And it was just like, oh, but what about all this if I leave? So not only is it that, well, I've got here, but it's also, I will lose all this if I leave, particularly if I want to start over in something else. But the whole point for me of being in restaurants was as a stepping stone. It just, and this is, I think, what happens for people which is great if the stepping stone really leads to where you want to go. Yeah. <clears throat> but it is so often that we do a sort of stepping stone thing and then we get stuck because it's working. This is not to say for those of you who've like, I thought it was a stepping stone, but it's actually led somewhere I want to be. That's yeah, as fantastic. much as I'm a line grad school. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's fantastic. That's, that's what we want. We want to be where we want to be. Mm -hmm. And however you get there, that's fine. The problem isn't that. The problem is if this isn't where you want to be or it's not enough, mm -hmm. you know, because then we get into this scarcity thinking it's not enough, but I'm not enough, but I can't have more. And you can see how this kind of thinking about um, there's not enough of something, but I could get more of something. And it also applies to other um, experiences we have in relationships to mm -hmm. do with love, you know, there's not enough love. Um, a parent doesn't have enough love for all their children. Therefore, there's the decision that happens for those kids in terms of lovability, in terms of their sense that there's more over here for someone else, but not for me, right? Um, or the truth is there isn't always enough time, right? Mm -hmm. But if we're stuck in some way, we're losing out because 
we have a narrative that's not supporting our enoughness, whether there's not enough time for attention or love, or there's not enough love, or there's so much competition, there's not enough in, in terms of relationship, but there's not enough good people out there that plays into the, this mm -hmm. is the best I can do. Mm -hmm. There's not enough good jobs out there, or it's so competitive out there, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Out there being somewhere dangerous and risky. Therefore mm -hmm. I should stay safe in what I have and what I know. Well, you're also, it, it also sounds like you're talking about a level of, um, of uh, sunk cost. Right. And that's Absolutely. something. That's something. You know. You mentioned that in regards to your your uh, your restaurant days that you spent so much time in this position building it up. What will I lose in terms of my time and my commitment if I bail now? Mm -hmm. And even that, I'm I'm deliberately using the word bail in in an evocative sort of in an evocative way because um, I, I you know a lot of people fall into that with, um, well, I am definitely abandoning bailing because I spent so much time here um, as opposed to I'm making an active choice to extricate myself. Right, I'm not a quitter comes up right. as another thing sometimes people it, say. It's moral. Mm -hmm. Right, it, it, yeah. I mean, actually one of the worst jobs I, I worked was not my last restaurant job, but somewhere in there towards the end right? I worked at this one restaurant, very highly regarded, absolutely awful chef to work with. And um, not so much knowledge of pastry. And so there was real kind of uh, discomfort about my knowing more than, than this person did. Um, but, but that was my job, right? To know more in this one specific area. But anyway, there was- Wait, hold on. The pastry chef knows more than the head chef? Uh, about, pastry. about pastries, <laughs> I'm shocked. I know, right? A specialist Stunning. knows more than someone whose job is to generally know things. Right. Shocked face. Uh, absolutely <laughs> awful. Yeah, and so really, really a very difficult person. I would argue some serious mental health issues. Um, just mean as well. Maybe some personality disorders. Hey, who's diagnosing? But it's fun to think about <laughs> in retrospect. Very, very difficult person. Terrified a lot of people um left people feeling very and, and this is not atypical for the restaurant experiences is there people like this um anyway it just it just was like i got really sick and i remember um i had terrible issues with eczema on both my hands and feet i mean it felt like my hands were on fire mm -hmm. um it was an absolute awful environment and i was telling myself no you know, I'll get somewhere if I stay here. I need mm -hmm. to at least put in a year and a half. Um, That's sunk cost. Was, the sunk cost, exactly. And from here, I could go <clears throat> to other good jobs, but, you know, if I leave too soon, right? So there was this sort of analysis around, you know, this is something special and I need to, to, to deal with it and I need to tolerate it. And it's not going to be, um, I'm not going to be able to work at this caliber again at the very least, if I don't tolerate it for a while. So definitely sunk cost, uh, not enoughness, not feeling enough and good enough as I, as I was, not mm -hmm. trusting in my own capacities and that I had, of course, accumulated with time and experience. Um, and then continually being put down in an environment also makes this so much worse for people, right? Because then we feel not enough, right? It becomes... Right a personal sense of not enoughness therefore i must need to endure this so it becomes quite abusive actually well it certainly can and we see this in certain industries mm -hmm. i mean you mentioned the restaurant industry and i certainly have seen this in the game industry as well there's certain studios and every studio is a little different um, but there are definitely managers and certain studios that weaponize this passion and this idea that you're lucky to have this job because there's 12 other people lined up to take your place. Yes. Um, you will not have it as good. And, and, you know, between that sunk cost, that fear of a lack of future employment opportunities, that scarcity mindset, it keeps a lot of people in these, uh, in these you know, potentially abusive situations. You know, sometimes it's a subtle thing. Sometimes it's a really overt thing. And the same thing can be said about personal relationships that, you know, uh, but there's, uh, there, yeah, the, I, I'm, 
I'm almost going off tan on a tangent here. I was going to start talking about a rival fallacy as well. This idea that it'll be better when. Um, well, I like I do think that, you know, just from what I've heard you all talk about, that seems like that could play into it as well of like, mm -hmm. if I get enough of these, then I don't have to worry. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Therefore, it will be better when. Yeah. There will be a sense of abundance then. Yeah. Right. Right. So which, you know. We're very wired to think in terms of scarcity and abundance because it was a reality for millennia for us as humans in terms of safety and mm -hmm. food, yeah. um, you know, and, and also scarcity in terms of uh, harvest, if you think about it, yeah. or growth sure. periods seasonally. And so, so this is pretty hardwired for us. And so in terms of how we talk to ourselves, the stories we tell around how we cope with this, mm -hmm. but absolutely it will be better when, or I'll have enough when. Yeah. Right. And, 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 you know, I feel that this is a constantly moving target sometimes so that makes it very, very difficult. It's like, I'll have enough when, but then we get there and it's like, oh, but now I want more or now I perceive things differently and it's not yeah. enough actually. Well, and that's the arrival. I mean, that's a, it's a relatively yeah. new term. I, I haven't seen any peer reviewed re literature on it, but it's a term that I think a Harvard psychologist coined this arrival fallacy, the idea that I have this, a uh, really concrete idea of what things will be like when I reach a metaphorical destination. Maybe it's a literal destination. Maybe it's a position. Maybe it's a step. Maybe it's a situation in life. But the truth is that when you get you, you put it so beautifully, Mitra, that when I get there, I perceive things differently and things. Yes, I've achieved something, but also it's not the same as I expected. There's nuances, there's downsides mm -hmm. as there are to all situations. And, you know, all this effort I put into, you know, hoarding whatever it is and i mean hoarding with a lowercase h by the way mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. the uh you know uh, these resources that i knew i would need turns out maybe i didn't fully understand the situation and i don't need some of these things after all yeah. and i'll make light of it but like me playing super nintendo final fantasy <laughs> I didn't need those resources after all, which <laughs> is evidenced by what my item screen looked like at the end of the game. I have so many Phoenix downs. Because um. <laughs> you you never know. Yeah. You never know. Well, no, I See, can't use it right now during this fight. I need it for the big fight. There might be a fourth final form for the boss. I'm, I'm saying. I'm saying. I'm just loving the introduction of the term arrival fallacy. Thank you so much for that. Well, Don't the, I think it I, just really illustrates it beautifully. Yeah. I will say is that uh, we, we are going to go into more of that down the down the season here. Um, so but uh, yeah, that that is definitely one that is is crosses over with this, um, which I do think the, the scarcity uh, mentality can come from. Um, real quick, let's take a quick break to remind our viewers and listeners of our disclaimer, and then we'll talk a bit more about hoarding our health potions. Be right back. Champions of Psychology is meant as education and entertainment. It is not a substitute for medical advice or professional counseling. Discussion of mental health topics will be primarily rooted in research and the personal experiences and self-disclosures of the hosts. While we can provide generalized education and possible mental health resources, we cannot offer any recommendations, advice, or opinions for any specific persons, cases, or situations. We provide these resources and links at our sole discretion, but have not necessarily vetted or reviewed any resource. We assume no liability for the use of the information or resources on these sites, and we encourage you to use your own best judgment. Okay, so uh, I I think it'd be fun. Uh, well, fun. Uh, I think it'll be interesting for us to talk about some of the health potions that we've hoarded and why we've hoarded them. Who wants to go first? <laughs> um, I think I think I got we gotta let Doctor P go first. Okay. That face, that that yeah. There's something there, man. Okay. Yeah, okay. I want to well, hear more. Sorry. Just, uh, some just, of it's just, accidental. Some of it is just sentimental. But some of it turned into a real win for me. All right. Okay. Um. So my <laughs> here's my best hypothesis for one of them. But I'll get actually you'll get into that one in a sec. But my magic cards. My magic cards, because I haven't, okay, so for those of you who are Magic the Gathering fans, I haven't played Magic regularly since Ice Age, okay? 
And so I started playing, it's unfortunate that I started playing with revised because I missed <laughs> like the really big stuff. Yeah. And it became discouraging to me in those days because it was like 14, 15. And, you know, I was going to the going to the hobby shop and there were guys who were like chaos or mocks everything. And oh, I'm like, geez. this is not fun. I bought look at me. I bought a booster pack and it, they had the disposable income to annihilate me. Mm -hmm. But I also had a lot of fun being really bad at magic in the early days with my friends. And so I ended up saving a lot of my, you know, almost all my cards. And, um, I, you know, it turns out I, I found out recently that a few of them are kind of valuable. I have a revised Badlands. Ooh, um, nice. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I've got a few framed ones here and there that I put up for sentimental value. And it turned out to be a little bit uh, lucrative um, if I ever decide to sell them. But I probably won't just for sentimental reasons because they that's uh, that's been meaningful to me. But my mom, my mom is one of those people who I guess is of a generation where, you know, you have extra gifts laying around the house on the, you know, in case you need to give them to people. Mm -hmm. And way back in the day, she purchased an extra copy of an NES game for me right for getting, she gave it to me and we rediscovered it a couple years ago. <laughs> And it turns out it's still in the original seal. Yup. Pinball and for the NES. Yeah. A 9.0. 9.0 um, with a B plus seal. Um, That's amazing. Yeah, no, I'm super pumped about that. It's It has a very special place in my nerd horde. Um, <laughs> I mean, even that, I have a nerd horde of things that people have given me and so forth. They have mo Most of it has no practical purpose beyond the yeah. sentimental to me. Um, few of them apparently are I, I found out later. I'm like, hey, that's worth something. I'm like, cool. I'm not gonna sell it, but yeah. cool. Yeah, that was that um, was like when I found out the 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 one Gandalf pop figure that I have, just because I was like, hey, look, it's Gandalf. I'll buy it. And it turns out that thing is two hundred dollars in the box, and I'm like, well, I took it out, and I don't really care about selling it because it's a cool little Gandalf figure. So whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's and hob good. hobbies are like that. Yeah. Yeah, collecting is interesting for that reason, because some people do it for very sentimental reasons, and others do it to acquire things. And then I want to talk a little bit about hobbies and stash collection, mm -hmm. because um, I noticed this with, uh, there's actually a term. So in, among knitting groups, there is this term called SABLE, all capital, because it's an acronym for stash above and beyond life expectancy in other words <laughs> hey mini painters we're we're now adopting that it's no longer just for our brushes <laughs> yeah no no what yeah. was it sable yeah Stash oh, above and beyond that. life expectancy yeah oh, yep. i've got so many minis too oh I yeah i don't i am in this tweet and i don't like it uh-huh uh, we'd like to <laughs> unsubscribe from these notifications <laughs> I'm I'm liking the for the horde comment. <laughs> Such a great crossover there. That oh one. my god! <laughs> oh lord! Yeah. And, and and then so among those who sew, like myself, there was once at, uh, about a couple of years ago there was a great article published um, by a blogger um, called Closet Core. Uh, she puts out a line of patterns as well, mm -hmm. but she wrote this article called um, Just Make It Already, and it was addressing your precious fabric. You oh. know, the stuff that's beautiful, silk or yeah. something. She said, I don't care if it's made with unicorn eyelashes, just make it already. <laughs> like, come on, why are you saving this thing? And so this, you know, crosses over into the concept once again of the good China or there yeah. will be a day where I'm ready to. Um, what I noticed in myself, certainly as far as the good materials, right? Whether it's the, the really lovely acrylics or the watercolors or those fine journals. We're going to get to the journals in a second. Whoa, you think we haven't forgot it. about your notebooks. Dang it. Have not forgotten about the notebooks. But it's this idea of like when I'm good enough, right? So that's the arrival piece. When I'm skilled enough to use this, whatever I've acquired, the fantastic, you know, like, uh, who, what is it? Um, this, the fantastic, really fancy yarn um, or the really beautiful silk fabric or the whatever it is, right? Or that mini that's, you know, really complex or interesting to paint and I'm just not ready, you know? Um, yeah, or the lovely watercolor paper, whatever it is, what are we saving it for? Yeah, yeah. There's nothing wrong with saving it, but- Perfection. What are we saving it for? There's Perfection. no such thing. 
<laughs> saving it for. I will find the perfect place to put that sticker. Thank you. Yep. Because oh my, my friend's god, company yeah. deserves that. The sticker. Oh god, so many the, right you, here. You, I'm okay. just waiting Gorgeous for a place to put them. You, you know what's so almost cute. worse than hoarding the stickers? My prize band a sticker. Is when you actually do put a sticker in the wrong place. <laughs> and oh, you're like, this god. is why. This is why I don't put them on anything. No, no. <laughs> this is Am why I ruin my Xbox by doing that. Yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, no, I, I, I've, I've a thousand percent done that, but, uh, I mean, though I, I unfortunately didn't, uh, keep it out the, the show, but one of the things that we talked about yesterday that I have, I have an original player's guide for Pokemon, uh, uh red and blue and inside mm -hmm. of it, it has every one of the 151st Pokemon in pixel form as a sticker in there. Cause you were supposed to take them off and stick them on the thing when you caught them. And mm -hmm. I went, no, because I'm going to find something <laughs> cool to use that for. And guess what? That has been over 20 years. <laughs> that it's I just never that. been cool enough. Never cool enough. But uh, <laughs> recently I did figure out what I want to do with it. I want to get like a cool little frame shadow box thing and like space them out and everything. Um, well, that's cool. But the thing is, though, is that freaking fourth grade me wasn't thinking about that <laughs> fourth grade me was never just like well i have a nice wall decoration <laughs> I, I have a thought i would really like to now see a DD &D item of mitra's magic garb of unicorn eyelashes i would love like the magic the tunic of unicorn eyelashes made oh, by yeah. mitra yeah that would be great it would probably be my really gorgeous four ply silk that i'm terrified to Cut into, but I will do it. I will do it. Well, I have a plan. So, so I do. So why, <laughs> There's well, a plan. Well, you were talking about the 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 fabric though, and you know, point though we're going to get to the, the the journal thing. I will bring up the journal thing because I do have a a point there that connects to it. Um, I have I have a lot of journals. Like there there is a huge joke in the writing community of like, oh, got a new book idea, better buy a notebook. Um, and there, I mean, that's also with like bullet journaling and scrapbooking and all this stuff. There there's so many places where notebooks or you know anything like that, you just get a bunch of them because you don't know when you're going to... I mean, heck, right now, within reach, I have two notebooks. <laughs> um, it, <laughs> right next to me over here, behind my D&D &D books, are the notebooks that I have... Uh, but don't want out because I don't need a reminder that I have so many of them. Uh. <laughs> In a striking parallel process, I was waiting for the perfect moment for you to start talking about the notebook thingies in this episode. <laughs> The time is nigh! Oh. <laughs> Keep going. Oh and you know, I I bet we all know some place <laughs> wherever she is, Latia Jaquise is feeling okay. called out. I may have been thinking about Latia while I was talking because she and I have talked about bull journals, <laughs> but just because we have the same olive color traveler's notebook does not mean anything. <laughs> um but no, the the but the thing is though, is that um yeah, like like the this this uh the, I mean I'm not gonna hold up completely because it's my wallet, but I, I got this recently, which is uh it's a wallet and it holds a field notes journal. And like literally yesterday while we were having this meeting, I was like, Yeah, I got it over the weekend. Still haven't written anything because I need that good <laughs> first idea to put in there. And uh and Mitra's like, just write something. So I did, and it felt great. And now I've written more things since then. Um, oh good. Yeah. And and, and it really does come down to that that perfectionism Whoa. of like, no, I <laughs> I have to keep this notebook perfect. I have to, I have to, you know, make sure, like if it's a bullet journal, it's like, I got to have the perfect layout. I need to know what my layout mm -hmm. is before I even start working on it in the book. And mm -hmm. I was like that for a really long time. Um, and, and as you can see, like, I still have some tendencies like that, but when it came like bullet journaling actually helped me break out of that because I was like, no, no one else is going to see this. It does not matter. Mm -hmm. I can, I, one of, one of the bullet journals I have has, I think seven different forms of layout throughout the entire thing. And it doesn't hurt anyone. <laughs> um, but the, the, the going back to the, the fabric though, why this was connected was there are so many times with notebooks where it is the, it's the special edition one. It, 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 you know, like this oh. is, we're only putting this one out for a little bit. Mm -hmm. Oh, this one's got this special thing about it. Oh, we, we partnered with these people for this limited run thing. And oh, yeah. I used to get those and I would never use them because, well, I gotta, I gotta put something in there that fits with what this is. Or like, you know, I, that, that, that is, that's worthy of this one. And so, yep. you know what I started doing? 
I stopped buying those. Because That's a great idea. Because I, otherwise, when we get to, sorry to interrupt, oh, no, no. as soon as we say, if I am not worthy enough in some way, scarcity right there. Yeah. 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 It, it, unless I pick one of those up and I know instantly what I'm going to use it for, it goes right back on the shelf. Because I, yeah. I can stand there and be like, this looks so cool. I love how they did this. This is fantastic. But unless I know right then what I'm holding in the store, what I'm going to use it for, I put it back on the shelf because it's just going to, it's going to sit on my shelf like all of the Lord of the Rings moleskin journals I bought uh, or, or the, the special edition bullet journal ones that never got used. And yeah, so. yeah, but those Lord of the Ring ones are still trying to walk towards their goal. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's really what they're doing. They're gathered together. They've got a fellowship of the page and they're going to. <laughs> Of the they're, page. they're going to climb the summit of Mount Inspiration <laughs> and throw themselves in the fire of productivity. That's what, welcome to this pep talk. Yes. By Dr. I, right, yes. With, with Shelob at every corner and the Nazgul circling, telling right. you you're not enough. I'm going to catch you in my <laughs> Oh yeah, no, the Nazguls are you know? like discarded trapper keepers of days. <laughs> yeah. Where are the eagles when you need them? I want to know. <laughs> Sorry, the trapper keeper killed me. <laughs> but uh but yeah so so I, I i think you know we're 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 running low on time here for for getting to the point where we're gonna ask some listener questions uh but uh i want to know what is what can we do what can we do about it because i i you know the example i gave just there was just me getting fed up with it and saying i'm not gonna buy this one anymore mm -hmm. i but think if you know it evokes that in you then it's a good idea to not buy it what I started doing was I got, um, cause you can get some really nice uh, leather sort of covers, but regular uh, sketchbooks fit inside them. And so your journal can be this ever changing thing. So it's not as precious as a journal that has a specific, mm -hmm. you know, goal or specific art on it. So I, I certainly learned to do that. Um, and then sometimes it's tough if you're buying things for a specific purpose and then you don't get to it yeah. and it sits there and it's kind of lost its potency. Um, I, it's kind of good to look at that stuff and just use it then. Well, one of the things that I've been doing recently, like I made the joke about like, you know, um, you know, Oh, I got a new book idea. I'm going to go get a book, which, you know, there's purpose in that. But like n when I recently, I got a, a masterclass account and I knew that I was going to watch several different teachers in there. Um, and I wanted a place to keep it all together. So I decided I was going to go to my local Barnes and Noble, get a Lindstrom notebook. And that was going to be my masterclass notebook. And so I, I've been using, I've been taking notes in it as I've been watching them. And that is what that is for. And it's been working. I did the same thing with Elden Ring when it came out. I was like, I want to have a cool kind of like, uh, you know, te uh, tech. I can't think of the word. Tactile? Tactile. I want tactile. something tactile Just, there. So I'm going to go get a notebook to keep track of like NPCs and quests and markers and all this stuff. And so I did that and I actually bought stickers and used them and wow. put them all over the book and everything. Lovely. My um, God. So yeah, when, when it, when it has, when I, I find that when I have purpose like that for something that I normally do the hoarding of the health potions with, I feel better about it. Like it, I'm more excited constantly for it than I am when I just buy it. So for me, there's a, there's a, there's a tension between two questions that I ask myself. Mm -hmm. um, one of them is, and you both are touching on this intentionality. Do mm -hmm. I have a clear purpose for this? Maybe it's to be, is this something I'm going to use? Is this something I'm going to wear? Is this something I'm simply going to collect and display? And all of those are absolutely fine. Um, is this something I need in case of an emergency? Well, but there's also the second question I ask myself is how much of my life is this taking up? And that, mm. that becomes a question of a, a, a very broad concept in terms of physical space, in terms of mental space, in terms of time spent. Like if I have emergency supplies, if I have, I don't know, enough emergency supplies for a year, how much time am I going to need to spend monitoring um, and I mean like food, um, how much time am I going to need to spend cataloging and inventorying to make sure things stay fresh and up to date in case yeah. I need them. And, you know, if you live, there are people who need to do that and cool, great. We're still talking about intentionality. And if that's where your, your, your priorities are, then mm -hmm. fine, great, good on you. 
but I only have so much space living in city. Yeah. And um, so I have to balance anxiety and what ifs with physical practicalities. And so that's, those are the two questions I'm asking myself. Why am I doing this? Being really clear. And how much of my life is this going to take up? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Because am I in service of the thing or is the thing in service of me? Mm -hmm. And I think this becomes, you know, that, this is ooh, sort I of, like that. I like that. No, I thank you. Thank you. I'll be here for the next however long. Um, but it's but truly it's it's that we sometimes acquire things that we're not ready to use. Yeah. And and we there's this aspirational piece to it. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. when I have time, I'll knit that thing right. up, or when I have time, I'll put together those Lego sets or whatever. And 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 sometimes that's okay, right? But after a point, it can be oppressive because I have all this stuff and it's kind of waving at me. Hey, come use me, come deal with me. And I'm just like, oh, you know, that's too much, or I'm not ready, or I'm not at that skill level, or I don't have any time. You know, and then I just feel I might feel shame or guilt around acquiring those things that I'm not using. So mm. because the process of acquiring can be compelling in itself. Um, but we have to think about our use of and enjoyment and pleasure in things. And if it's right. going to oppress us in some way, give it away. Yeah. You know, or if you're done with it, you have to accept it and give it away because the, otherwise you're yeah. in service of the thing yeah oh god that's good metaphor i mean that's just so good the the other thing that i i kind of want to throw in there and this is just from personal experience is is being honest with yourself um, yeah like mm, um like so I, like i just showed i i've got this it, it is a wallet and it holds a field notes journal in it it, it is it's large but it, it's thin enough that it, it fits in my pocket um mm -hmm. and for a while i was like oh you know what i'll do i'll get one of those little hardcover moleskin notebooks and I'll carry that around with me. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, you know, I'll write down, you know, uh, part mainly it was like, write down like what I was doing in to order to remember the small things better because of ADHD, where I would just like, I would be watching a, a season of a show completely forget I was doing that and not keep watching it. And so I wanted to try and keep track of that and, and whatnot. Mm. And, um, I didn't, I just didn't, I didn't write a damn thing in that notebook. I even bought a small little pen to go with it and everything. Didn't write a damn thing in it. I, I, in fact, I got so fed up, uh, with it at one, uh, about not having done anything. I just chucked it across the room. Cause I was so upset with myself that I bought mm. something and wasn't using it. And because I was convinced that I was going to, and it just came down to like finding what worked. Like I, I should have just taken a step back and go, that's not working. That's not, I, I, I can get rid of this notebook because it is not working and I can mm -hmm. find something else that does work. And I now know little hardcover notebooks do not work for me. So I will not buy any more of them because yeah. I'm being honest with myself that I know that doesn't work. Yeah. A hundred percent. I think we can be really compelled by certain things that don't have as much, um, use in our lives and i remember actually i was following this one uh fashion blogger at one time she was big into sort of recycling and reusing and recreating with what you had and um you know i used to absolutely love beautiful summer dresses but i live in the pacific northwest <laughs> where it rains okay. a lot wait 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 this is going somewhere <laughs> so you don't store this beautiful summer dresses for the three days Right? Listen. I mean, how many do you this need? This Southern California guy who loves jackets doesn't relate to this in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> right? Exactly. <laughs> so she talked about how you need to shop your dominant season. And I wish I could remember her shop name here, your but. Dominant season. Right. Suddenly and my thought hoodie about collection it. feels vindicated. <laughs> right? Exactly. And so I've often thought about that just in relation to what we make, what we use. Um, what do I use more of? And, and, and often the things we're more familiar with, familiarity, what does it breed? Is it contempt or something? You know, we're overly, we're like, oh yeah, but that's not exciting. But the thing is, while you can spend a lot of money on the special occasion things, if they're there just for special occasions, we're not going to use them that much. Yeah. 
If you have eight dice sets, but you're lucky enough to play okay. D&D once a month, change I, your situation. <laughs> okay, not eight. I'm I would not. like to I'm speak to really HR shocked. about Mitra's flagrant assault on our character. <laughs> I'm actually really My shocked that dice haven't come into the conversation <laughs> until right now. It's, it's, you know, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> And it doesn't help so, that I have dice shaped like health potions. Um, oh, oh my gosh, those? Yeah, the crossover. Oh, I love those. <laughs> <laughs> but the um, chat's right. Know. Mitra says play more D&D. Got it. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> play more D&D. I mean, if you're aspiring to collect something because you love the thing, then maybe you need to find a way to engage in the thing. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the problem is the stuff is just going to add to your disappointment. I oh. have this stuff. But I can't use you mean, it. There's you no mean all those Warhammer minis I have? <laughs> okay. I don't have time to make paint or HR! Play. <laughs> HR! <laughs> I don't want to hear you staring at my Dark Angels collection. No! Hey, all right. Well, at least they look a little cooler than the Tau. Um, <laughs> let's let's hop over and see what chat's been up to while we've been talking. Because uh, we're, we're running a little low on time. Uh, let's see. The Lurking Rider says, question, to make this relevant to video games. What are your opinions on this scarcity mindset and how does it, uh, and how can it be in game without being considered uh, predatory? Oh, they mean from like a game development standpoint. Oh, God, that's that's a whole thing unto itself. Yeah. And again, I, I think I said this the last episode, but if you if you make sure to follow Dr. Rachel Cohort, um, yes. she is an absolute expert on the subtleties of randomized game mechanics. Yeah, um, because there's a lot of differences within how randomized game mechanics or val items of rarity are presented in games. And some are obviously more predatory than others. Um, I like to think, actually, I like to think about Magic the Gathering, and I actually like to think about Idol Champions for the people who, like, do it well, um, because, you know, I can play Idol Champions, and there's so much stuff I can get for free. Mm -hmm. um, with Magic the Gathering, I know I'm getting a rare card. I know I'm getting, two, like, two uncommons with a booster pack, um, and... But there's obviously some more, you know, predatory stuff yeah. out there that takes yeah. advantage of that. Yeah, I would say really when you're playing, pay attention to how you're feeling about it, right? Um, do you feel ripped off sometimes? Are you just enjoying yourself? Like at one point I was playing Hearthstone and I would sort of collect the packs and things like that. And, you know, you could spend, uh, as with Magic or any of these things, you can spend a fair amount of money acquiring stuff where you don't exactly know what you're getting. How, are, how do you feel when you open it? How do you feel when you check it out? Is it Does it feel satisfying? Is it enough? Is it entertaining? Um, and how much of your uh, hard-earned real income are you are yeah. you using? So it's, these, are, these are just questions that, you know, no one can answer for you necessarily because some people are perfectly happy spending more than others, but it's a matter of what's coming up for you. So. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a good question though. Um, yeah. Let's see. Uh, Babylon Ranger 2261. Uh, how much of physical hoarding can be linked back to, oh, generational trauma from the Great oh, Depression, I wonder. Absolutely. So much. And, uh, the Holocaust, Great Depression, absolutely. any kinds of other personal well, here, trauma. Here's a wild yeah. one. My, my grandfather um, used to keep as many, um, like, um, uh, home repair supplies as possible. He was a carpenter and like all the extra stuff he would hold on to. And I never really understood why until we were out at dinner one night and, you know, talking about the good old days with him and, and you know, when he was younger and he told me that when he joined the army, his uh, or the air force, his family uh, moved and they just left all of his stuff. They just left all of his stuff in a pile next to the house they left, uh, including, and this one, this one hurt as a nerd, a uh, first issue of Superman. <laughs> Action <laughs> Comics number one? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so that made a lot more sense to me why he was holding on to certain things so mm -hmm. much because literally everything he had as, you know, up until he was 18 was just left somewhere. Yeah, when you when you get into families with multiple migrations, when you get into stories about refugees or yeah. uh, wartime loss, yeah. mm -hmm. um, absolutely, people who've experienced utter loss and maybe even you know not having enough food, yeah, um, and not being not knowing where their next meal was coming from, you hundred yep. percent they're going to want to stock up. 
And in some cases, this can be to their detriment in the end, but, but we must have empathy for how we get there. There's and, usually trauma behind it. Yeah, well, and it has intergenerational effects. And there's yeah. just something I've observed that, you know, I, I'm i second generation in this country, and but I know the boat that my, my grandparents came over on, my dad has the shipping manifest of one of the ones where, you know, my aunt, I think it was my great grandfather, Francesco Bogomazzo came over and um, it, being very poor, undereducated immigrants, you know, there's, there's behaviors that were taught to my father who were taught to me, like, I don't waste food. Like I do not, I, I have made myself sick on multiple occasions eating things because other people were like, oh, I'm done with it. I'm like, there's this com- weird like tension in me. I'm like, ah, I can't yep. throw that away. Yep. Um, but even looking at, you know, what's outside, I, you know, in the Pacific Northwest here in Seattle, do you know how many dandelions we have? And they charge four bucks a pound at Whole Foods for dandelion greens. Are you kidding me? That's a weed. I'm just going to go clip some of that stuff. <laughs> you can make capers out of the buds. Are you kidding me? But it, and that's, that's actually a behavior I've talked to like other grandchildren, you know, children and grandchildren of immigrant families, even if they were born in the United States and that sort of, no, we use everything mentality is there. And it's, yeah. it's a strange thing. Yeah. yeah. And you know, because then you feel terrible when you don't like, it is an act of rebellion almost. Not oh yeah. To, because, because that's, that's absolutely the training. I mean, I get that. Okay. Yeah. You know, feel called out there, but you know, I'm with you on it, uh, you know, and on one hand, there's really something quite marvelous about being able to use everything or consider all parts of whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, my my aunt would cut the tops off a milk carton and use the rest of the carton to store the tea bags and the compost and the other stuff before throwing it out. I, you know, that was it's an interesting habit. Oh, you're you're relating to that one. Oh are God, you? Yeah, oh <laughs> God, yeah. No, we. Uh, my dad, you, my dad did the same thing with eggshells and so forth. And um, like whenever I get takeout pho, um, I'm looking at that the plastic tub they give me the broth in and I just put that in the top dish of the, di- the top rack of the dishwasher I'm like that is what I make ice cream in that is what I make summer sorbets in, and that is what I give people when I give them you know leftovers to take home from my meals that oh, yeah. is getting reused I ain't throwing that away that's a good container yeah. Yeah, there were these really beautiful takeout containers from one place we used to get. And it turned out the food at first was good, but it got gradually less good. But I had a real nice collect, connect, collection of these sort of nine inch by five inch takeout containers that I gave to a, a young friend who liked to make baked goods for people for Christmas. That's awesome. And it was the absolute perfect size and shape for cookies and, you know, other little things that they like to give as gifts. So, mm-hmm. yeah, you know, you have to. You don't want this to take over your life. You don't want an entire pantry of takeout containers that you're not using, but that you keep accruing. Um, <laughs> hello? Yes? You, you said yes. COVID was rough, okay? <laughs> it's because I Sometimes... didn't have anybody coming over for food because I was being responsible and continue to be. <laughs> Sometimes there is enough. Find a new home for stuff. I, I stopped I at three is... stacks, Okay. This is where we ask, are you in service to the takeout containers or are they in service to you? But there is that anxiety and tension that goes yeah. along with it. Totally. There, and it's, it, totally. there's a legit, there's a legit, the, you know, that question was so on point that can, can cohort generational or even personal trauma play a part in this 100%. Yeah. 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 Um, I have one more question that I want to do uh, before we got to get, get out of here. But uh, this is from Monkey House question. How is this uh, hoarding impulse impacted by changes slash increases in wealth, abundance or other markers of a more stable life? Oh, you know, that's a really good one. And what I what we often see is that um, unless we do some personal work, the trauma story can still be running a person's situation. So even if they are in a much uh, wealthier or stable or safe situation, they might still be, um, it, there might still be that internal anxiety. And also, um, I think righteous um, fury at the amount of waste that there mm-hmm. is in our world. And it's kind of like, even if I don't need it anymore, whatever it may be, um, it's just appalling that these usable items aren't being used. And so there's this tension between the reality of our now much more stable and safe life 
and also the we can now have more feelings about it because we're not in survival mode. So we can have feelings about the kind of waste that there is or the lack of um, recycling or other resources or, or even the lack of enough people to give things away too. Mm. So you're smiling. <laughs> Go uh, this, on then. In Dr. this episode B. of Dr. B uh, gets called out every three minutes. Oh God. <laughs> Hey, I'm calling myself out too. The yeah. first time I went to Disneyland, I was completely appalled. And I didn't get to go as a kid because I didn't grow up in, in uh, North America and, you know, moving around, if you know, you know, kind of thing. But uh, there I was at Disneyland with kids who were, let's see, 10 and 8 and 5, I believe. And so much waste, right? So little recycling, so much waste, so much wasted food, uh, everything, right? And my husband just looked at me and was like, what would the five-year-old care about? Mm. Because I'd see these pictures of teacup rides and all this stuff as a kid, Aww. and I was just desperate to give it a go and, uh, and to, to be there. And here we were, right? And he said, what, what does the five-year-old want? So sometimes, even if we don't love something, we have to turn our gaze so that we can fully appreciate and enjoy that moment now for us. We had a blast. Nice. But it did take letting go of my own notions of, of waste and too much and plenty, just to kind of shift that so that I could actually take full advantage of that time. Nice. Um, well, uh, thank you both uh, for sharing that. Uh, unfortunately, we do have to get out of here. Uh, friends, where can people find you if they'd like to do so on the interwebs? I'm not in many places. <laughs> no scarcity here. <laughs> Ask me for Jordan. <laughs> at Mitra Jordan and uh, MitraJordan.com. So feel free to get in touch, folks. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm around. Let's talk about a lack of scarcity. I'm just professionally around. Um, <laughs> you can you can follow me on pretty much all the socials at the Dr. B, T-H-E-E-D-O-C-T-O-R-B as in boy. But it's more important that you follow Take This Org and keep up to date on all the stuff that we're doing. We've actually got a really cool announcement that's going to be happening this Ooh. week, and I'm not going to tell you what it is. So make sure to find us and follow for that. Heck yeah. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at the Trevor. There's an A hiding in there. And you can, of course, find me anywhere the Isle Champions community is because I'm the community manager. That's where I'll be. Uh, thank you to Jordan for moderating in the chat today and doing a fantastic job. Thank and thank you to Codename Entertainment and Take This for giving us an opportunity to have these discussions. Uh, if you missed any part of the show, you can catch it later as, uh, as a podcast on your favorite podcast service. Um, for the uh, rest of the day, uh, well, this is actually at uh, Bardic Inspiration is off this week, as is Bushwhacker Weekly. Uh, our streaming schedule is a little off this week in general. Uh, if you'd like to check it out you can find it on our twitter our discord and our reddit uh so be sure to check that out uh, if you want to know what we're up to but that is going to do it for this week's episode uh so until next week take care of yourself champions of psychology is meant as education and entertainment it is not a substitute for medical advice or professional counseling Discussion of mental health topics will be primarily rooted in research and the personal experiences and self-disclosures of the hosts. While we can provide generalized education and possible mental health resources, we cannot offer any recommendations, advice, or opinions for any specific persons, cases, or situations. We provide these resources and links at our sole discretion, but have not necessarily vetted or reviewed any resource. We assume no liability for the use of the information or resources on these sites, and we encourage you to use your own best judgment.